Good morning, everyone. Um, I think I'll be presenting something slightly different because I'm actually an economist by training, so maybe I'm one of the few social scientists in this series. I'm not entirely sure about that, but um, I'm trained in economics throughout my career, and um, I've been doing quite a bit of interdisciplinary work on the issue of world food systems. And through that interdisciplinary work, working with climate scientists, biogeochemists, ecologists, and so forth, I was um, asked to join the Environmental Earth System Science Department as the only economist. So I will be giving you a slightly uh, different talk, more on um, the economics and policy dimensions of biofuels and what it means for equity and energy use around the world. Um, not so much on the technology of ethanol or biodiesel production per se. I teach a number of classes here at Stanford. The big ones are the World Food Economy, which is an economics course, and Human Society and Environmental Change, which is an Earth Systems core course, and then a number of seminars on special topics that I do my research on. So anyway, I want to introduce this topic quickly on biofuels, food security, and the environment. And those of you who have been tracking the biofuels industry know that it's been going, growing very rapidly, particularly in the past six years or so, thanks, I think, in large part to U.S. policy. Um, the ethanol here is in the green, and the biodiesel is in the blue. Biodiesel is becoming a larger component, but still relatively small compared to ethanol. And it's important to realize in the ethanol business that there's two main players, the U.S., which has far surpassed Brazil now in terms of its production, taking about 57% of the market, and then Brazil. And so in the U.S., um, in the top left here, we're using mainly maize-based uh, products for our ethanol production. And in, in Brazil, it's sugar-based ethanol in the top right. Um, the biodiesel industry, though, is equally as important, and in the bottom right, that's rapeseed or canola, which the European un Union is developing mainly for their energy system. And I'm going to point out a, a relatively new one, which is on the bottom left, which is Jatropha, which has been developed in more marginal um, uh, conditions in poorer countries as an energy source. So these, I want to give you a visual of what we're talking about. And um, what's of interest to me is this new connection between the agricultural sector and the energy sector, which has really completely changed the agriculture and food economy. Um, now I have to learn all this stuff about energy. So I actually enjoyed this last talk, too, because it actually makes a difference in what we're looking at in agriculture and food right now. Um, there's a number of other crops, though, and when we're thinking about the environmental components of all of this, in the top right, that's an oil palm uh, plantation. And oil palm produces palm oil, which is a very efficient um, vegetable oil production system. It's not yet economically viable for biodiesel, but if it is and it becomes an economically viable source, uh, the rainforest, particularly in Indonesia, um, will be uh, in much more jeopardy of being cleared already. It's being converted at really rapid rates for oil palm production. Um, the bottom left is soy, and that's our main biodiesel. And then there's a number of indigenous crops grown around the world. At the top right is uh, sweet sorghum and then cassava. These are food crops, um, but could be also used as fuel. And so we have a food fuel trade-off going on in terms of how we use our land and how we use our water around the world. So uh, most of you probably know this, but there's a series of generations of biofuels. The first generation is the crop-based biofuels that I've just mentioned, and these are the ones that are economically viable today and in our gas tanks. Where we're heading with this whole industry is the second generation of the cellulosic-based biofuels. Um, they're not yet economically viable at a commercial scale. Um, the hope is to get them to be economically viable um, through the use of switchgrass, poplar and uh, other residuals from um, our crops, like uh, corn stover. And then ultimately, um, can we envision an algae system like this, actually create, you know, providing a lot of our energy needs as well as some of our basic food needs? Um, these kinds of system at scale that would be needed for, the, um, for being economically viable, as you can see, um, are water intensive, energy intensive, and, and quite land intensive. And so scaling up to this issue is it, there's always these trade-offs that we need to be considering at each step in the production. 
So there's been a wide debate surrounding biofuels in the United States. One, I think, really, it came into um, the policy incentives really were motivated by just rural revitalization. You know, we had a long period of declining rural prices in agriculture, and how do we stimulate the rural economy? Let's add another level of demand uh, to our basic crop, which is maize, and stimulate. So maybe we can take off all these production subsidies that we've had in the works in the United States for so long. So at one level, we could take off subsidies. On the other hand, we're paying a lot of money as taxpayers to support this industry. Um, obviously, it's an alternative fuel that we can wean off our fossil fuel uh, now, and it's about 10% of our transportation fuel is, is now in this ethanol, which is a good thing. Um, our overall energy budget, it's still quite small, as you probably already know. Uh, we could also lower our greenhouse gas emissions by having a more environmentally friendly production. And, and there's a lot of life cycle analyses of uh, ethanol and biodiesel production. When you transport and everything from fertilizers to transport to processing, um, the balance can be quite tight. And there's a lot of attention, particularly in the EPA, on the greenhouse gas emissions, as I'll mention. And then, of course, food security. You know, does adding a whole new dimension to the world food system stimulate um, agricultural growth, rural productivity, and um, enhance incomes in small uh, villages, like where this young uh, girl lives, um, and, um, or does it actually raise prices and, and hurt poor people? So I just want to say a couple of notes about the U.S. and our major role in this, because I think that the U.S. policies have really transform this biofuel um, economy now. And um, as I mentioned, that we are the big player in the system right now. Um, we've been doing this through a renewable fuel standards, the RFS. And the main component of this is our mandates, that we have a mandated amount, um, a quantitative goal, of rising from 12 and a half billion gallons of ethanol in 2010 uh, or renewable fuels overall, to 36 billion gallons in 2022. And some part of this, 15 billion gallons, will come out of this conventional maize-based ethanol. The remaining 21 billion gallons would come from the advanced ethanols or and biodiesels that we're producing. Um, and that's not yet in the works, as I said. It's not yet economically viable. The other important component of this is an EPA regulation back in 2005 where we phased out MTBE as the oxygenate in our gasoline and uh, replaced it with ethanol. And so when you go to the gas tank, you see E5 or E10. E10 means that 10% is oxygenate, um, and that's coming through our ethanol. So we have an automatic market for ethanol just through the need for this oxygenate in our gasoline. So this is what the schedule would look like going from, let me see if I can, yeah. Um, 2006, when we initiated our policies down to 2022, uh, the yellow is the maize-based ethanol, um, the conventional. The blue is what we don't yet have in the works. That's the advanced cellulosic. The green is actually advanced non-cellulosic. And this is a really important point because uh, Brazil sugar actually um, counts for this green bar here. And then the red is the biodiesel that's coming mainly out of soy. So it's an interesting pathway that we're on here, and, um, and it's transitioned a little bit over time. We have a long history, actually, of subsidizing this industry that goes back a couple of decades, actually, through a number of taxes and tariffs. Um, and these have been taken off as of the December of last year because they're really not needed. The industry has gone out of infant stage into full production now. Um, but we have actually had a new uh, uh, set of policies surrounding moving our oxygenate level up from 10% to 15%, which then guarantees a larger market for this maize-based ethanol or uh, crop-based ethanol. And that was really uh, started in 2010 and was recently confirmed through a series of hurdles in the spring of 2012. And so um, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that policy really matters. You know, this, this industry probably would not have just taken off on its own without a number of policy incentives. And so that's where the intersection of what I do and what you're hearing from Earth, uh, Earth sciences and so forth and engineering, that's the interesting intersection there.
Um, the other thing that's interesting is that the EPA has really tried to regulate the greenhouse gas component of this. And what they're saying is that biofuels have to be 20% lower in greenhouse gas emissions um, relative to gasoline in the future, accounting for direct and indirect land use change. So if you convert a rainforest to oil palm in order to get a biodiesel out of that, you have to account for all the greenhouse gas emissions that are coming out of the conversion of the forest as well. This is really tricky accounting. I should say it sounds better on the books than in practice. It's quite difficult to do this. Uh, but corn-based ethanol actually in the new natural gas-fired plants already meets this requirement, and it sure ensures we can you know, meet our mandate there. Um, and then that extra $20 billion um, from advanced biofuels has to be more than 50% lower in greenhouse gas emissions. And um, this is where... Actually, the sugar-based ethanol from Brazil counts. And so we have this odd situation last year where actually we were producing too much maize-based ethanol to actually use in our gas tanks. So we were exporting ethanol to Brazil. But to meet our mandate, we were actually importing sugar-based ethanol uh, to meet our mandate. <laughs> so Now, I don't know the energy accounting of that. I'll leave that up to you to uh, decide. But this is what policy does a lot of perverse things. Um, I'm going to give you a two-second preview on economics for those of you who aren't taking a lot of economics, but it really matters how the policies are structured in terms of the um, end result. Um, this is just basic price quantity. This is the demand curve for uh, maize, just including food and livestock feed. And with this initial curve, this is the supply. The initial equilibrium is a P0. If there's a supply shock, a big weather shock like we saw this year and supply shifts back, the price would increase to P1, okay? That's under the standard demand. Now let's say we increase demand to include biofuels and it's less elastic. It's not adjusting to market prices because it's mandated. You have to have it. So it's less elastic and it's much higher. Now when you have that supply shock, you're going from P2 to P3 the more inelastic, the larger the price shock. And so what we're seeing this year, for example, with our drought in the United States and these mandates in ethanol are quite large price shocks, 35% price rise in the couple of months leading up to the corn harvest. And so we're seeing a much more volatile market, which really impacts food security because especially poor people um, are hurt by a lot of swings in prices because they spend a lot of their money on food. So this has been maize prices that's always been pretty volatile, but in trend going down, and now it's volatile and going up. And so the question, is this a long-term trend, or is this just a blip at, that will disappear over time? Certainly these high prices do affect um, kids like this in Guatemala who um, eat maize as their primary staple and um, are really being priced out of the market now. And so these are the kinds of issues that I worry about. Um, as an economist, for those of you who ever take the rural food economy course, you will um, have a chance to do a big modeling effort with us and trace all the ripple effects through own price effects, cross price effects, income effects. That is, if food prices rise, it really hurts the household budget because a lot of poor households spend maybe 80% of their household budget on food. And so I'll just give you a, a quick sense of these kinds of patterns that you would be tracing in your model. You know, with the mandate, U.S. farmers are growing more corn, and then they might shift out of soy. But then Brazil would pick up the soy market because prices for soy would be higher. And they're growing soy in the Amazon rainforest, in the native grasslands, the Sahara. So there's a lot of land use change and environmental impact from that. Um, as the demand for corn rises and price rises, um, Wheat starts substituting in as a livestock feed, and then wheat prices rise. As wheat prices rise, consumers in the world shift from wheat to rice. Rice prices rise. So you see this big ripple effect through all these substitutions in production and consumption. And the main point is that the world is very connected. Um, so a big shock in the U.S. ripples throughout the world. Um, we just heard about the natural gas, and it's really important because the future of the energy economy, is it really going to be biofuels, or is it just going to be, you know, tra transition to natural gas in the future? Will the automobiles and so forth just make ethanol obsolete? You know, these are all big questions for you to sort out. Um, it does lower the cost, actually, for processing ethanol because that's the main fuel. Um, so I just want to touch on really briefly um, 
the expansion also of biofuels in poor countries, because it's not just the United States and Europe that are growing these. It's a number of poor countries that are trying to now create employment and incomes and diversify their cropping systems and maybe export this commodity to meet our mandates in the future if they grow sugar, for example. A lot of these economies are also energy poor and could use the biofuels for their own energy economy. And there's been some interesting work done here by Nussbaumer that I show where they calculate energy poverty across all kind of energy sources. And Africa definitely is one of the energy poorest regions of the world. So does biofuels um, really help them? You know, what they're looking at is kind of a phase-in strategy, first growing like, like sugar um, to export to our ethanol plants, for example, um, where they can get duty-free access. And then maybe developing their own ethanol or biodiesel industries and maybe actually replacing it as their own transportation fuel grows because these economies are also growing and their transportation fleets are growing. And so it's interesting to think about where this is all heading. A lot of it is in sugar and then in this jatropha crop, which I mentioned earlier. And jatropha is interesting because it was sort of the uh, miracle crop. It can grow in really bad conditions. Poor people can grow it and everything else. But when you get down to it, um, it's not a food crop, so it doesn't compete with food. But it really can't be used for food. You know, it doesn't have any human use. Um, and the yields are very low when you don't put water and you don't put fertilizer. So in fact, to make it commercial, you really want fertilizer and water. Um, essentially, these schemes are putting all the risk on the poor, you know, the poor producers here. And if it doesn't pan out, now they've got this jatropha crop. So it's, it's quite risky, I think. Um, as these governments um, in Africa and elsewhere are trying to attract foreign investment for these activities, um, they're being asked to do a lot. You know, give me big chunks of land so I can uh, create an industry here, develop infrastructure, roads and ports, a number of support policies. We want you to put on mandates. And so as the governments go down this road, there's a lot of trade-offs. They're investing now in biofuels and not in healthcare, education, and other things, for example. Uh, they might be taking land out of smallholders and giving it to these large corporations. Um, the cost, the fiscal cost of, of creating all these roads and ports is expensive and comes at the expense of other development objectives. And so it's not a clear-cut issue. And I know you're thinking about um, income and distribution as part of your overall course here. And so these are some of the issues you might want to focus on. In addition, some of these biofuels might take a lot of the water that's available. Only 4% four is irrigated. 4% of food is irrigated in Africa. And if more of the water goes to biofuels, it's not going to food. So these are all sorts of trade-offs. Um, and so I like to think about the environmental and the food security aspects of that. And with that, I will just open it to questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about some of the uh, US policy regarding biofuel mandates. Um, it seems like it's adding a lot of volatility to the food and energy system. But now you have basic demand that you can't really change. I was wondering how they think about building the flexibility into the system to take out some volatility, certainly security, availability, affordability, both fuel and food in the US. So how do they think about it? Do you think they did it right? <laughs> Well, they're kind of locking themselves in to some extent. Policy is interesting because I look at policy as as being a fairly long-term thing. Once once you implement it, it's hard to get rid of it because there's a lot of uh, constituents and supporters, and you know you have have a lot of uh, political capital invested. Some of the ways they're trying to build in flexibility is there are waivers. For example, this year with the corn crop being so bad and prices being so high, there's this waiver that says, well, maybe we don't have to meet the, the uh, mandate this year, but we can meet it next year. And, um, but it's really uncertain as to whether these waivers will make a difference, because actually the ethanol industries themselves are um, um, still buying and producing and 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 uh I'm, I'm not sure it's going to really change how much they demand on the market versus the livestock sector, for example. So it may be that in the end, the waivers are there, but the livestock sector still gets hurt. Um, there's also this uh, RIN trading system, which is there's identification numbers on all of these crops, and they can be traded in time and space. And so it does provide some... Um, uh, some room for kind of hedging, um, hedging um, what fuels you're using. Um, 
you know, over what time period and which companies, you know, companies that actually can't purchase the ethanol at this price today may get a pass on it and they'll, they'll buy a, a right to do it in the future. It's a kind of a complicated process, but they're trying to build in these sorts of flexibilities so that um, many of the companies that are involved in this wouldn't go out of business if they can't secure the feedstock they need at the time they need it, for example. Um, but at the larger energy scale, um, this, is, this is a bigger question, I think, for, for the whole group, bio, you know, ethanol relative to the other fuel sources. And um, right now, what is locked in, I think, is that ethanol is that oxygenate. And I don't think... Um, Anything else can really substitute for that on the market right now, although I'm not completely certain of that. But there are natural gas technologies that might come in and actually crowd out for future investments in advanced biofuels and so forth. So I think it's really open in terms of where this is going to head and how, um, uh, how um, persistent the government is in enforcing all of these mandates. Um, I'll just make one final note, since um, you know this is an election year, <laughs> and a big constituent is the the Midwest, Corn Belt, you know, and um, and we have um, obviously Obama from Illinois and um, Phil Sock, the Secretary of Ag from Iowa, and we also have um, the contestants coming from Wisconsin and so forth. So you know, there's a lot of um, constituents uh, interest being served here. It'll probably persist through the election, I would say. Yeah. Uh, in the blue, yeah. Um, regarding second generation biofuels, um, I mean, I remember back in 2003, people saying they're just around the corner. We're now almost a decade beyond that. And it seems like it's still just around the bend. Um, where are we after that? And, and I guess specifically, when you think of a crop like switchgrass, I have a hard time imagining how a really uh, uh, low density fuel can be harvested and processed and transported long distances. How does it work? Yeah, no, I think that's a that's an excellent question, and and it's good to keep in mind with our maize-based ethanol, we already had the technology from our high fructose corn syrup. I mean, there was already an enzyme process that broke uh, corn down to its essential sugars, and then used those sugars, you know, in food processing. But now we use those sugars in ethanol. So that industry was already there, and this this one, um, from what I understand, is the enzyme process is quite tricky to do at scale economically, and does require. Um, a fair amount of energy to do it as well. I also, um, even in 2007, I was saying, okay, like, um, you know, impatiently, where is this stuff? When are we going to get it? And, and it does seem to be dragging on. Actually, somebody from this energy in, um, community that you're in right now kind of changed my thinking on it and said a lot of energy technologies take a decade or two to actually take off, you know, so that we get, um, we're sitting in the Silicon Valley, we want instant innovation and so forth, but some of these energy technologies do take time. And so um, I'm going to defer to some of the experts on the enzyme processing side of that, but from what I understand, um, it's not there. And actually, the amount of wood, for example, in poplar that you would need to do the replacement is just enormous. I was talking to somebody up in Washington, you know, and they were talking about relative to you'd need several orders of magnitude of the current pulp and paper industry to supply this, for example. So supply in the feedstocks is not a simple thing. And I think if there's value in it, it will go on to agricultural land and create all these trade-offs again, you know, if that's the highest value commodity that farmers can grow. And so um, people talk about doing this in marginal lands, but again, marginal lands usually have marginal yields, and that's not the first thing that people will do. Um, there's been a lot of land conversion in marginal sort of conservation areas into corn, and I think the value has to be quite high to put it into something like switchgrass. So, um, so it's 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 still not there, and I, I don't know exactly when we would project it. Yeah. To follow up on the economics of it, this is kind of like the first thing we learned in economics is that price of fuels cause welfare distortion subsidies, same thing. Especially like this essential mandate uh, of the entire sector against this market share. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on some of those unintended consequences of 
subsidies affecting individuals in Africa and artificially inflating the price. What do you think are the full extent of these unintended consequences in the territory? Yeah, no, no, they're they're quite large, and they're they're they go on both sides actually, um, depending on whether you're looking at the short run or the long run. I mean, the short run, I don't think most people that were um, really thinking of these mandates and getting maize-based ethanol going were thinking about the global food economy. I mean, but. Um, but what you saw, it was coincided with a very rapid economic development period, too, um, throughout the world due to you know, all our financial uh, deregulation and so forth. And um, so there was a lot of demand for energy and food and everything. And those prices, now that you put this extra layer on, in international markets just skyrocketed. Well, a lot of African countries and, and other poor countries actually have transitioned to be large importers of food and have not really been investing over time in their agricultural markets. And um, there's a number of factors that are responsible for this. Part of it is declining real prices in food. Part of it is some um, uh, World Bank and other advice to take off earlier subsidies in the 1990s. Part of it is governance. You know, there's, there's a suite of things. Um, and so those countries that are really importing a lot of food and when you have international market prices going way up, you know, they are really jolted by that. Um, within poor countries, um, the poorest people do tend to be uh, net consumers, uh, not net producers. You would imagine farmers would do quite well, but uh, there's not um, there's many more poor net consumers, even if they are on farms, than net producers um, in this, particularly in this sector. Um, over the longer run, this has actually woken up the international community to say. We really need to invest in agriculture, agricultural technology, agricultural productivity, um, um, enhancers like supply chains and um, and you know uh, extension management, all of that kind of thing. And so, um, you, USDA has a new um, major international program supporting this kind of thing. It's small in the big scheme of things. It's got to be governments themselves that invest in this. But now the market signals are for more agricultural investment. Over time, this might be a good thing. In the short run, it's a real shock. And, and uh, you know, we have about a billion people who have inadequate diets and are basically go to hungry day to day. It's a real shock to them, and that's what I'm really worried about. And I think it's hard to pinpoint everybody, but the but the development community community has seen just a, a very massive effect in poor societies on this. Am I out of time, or should I take one more question? One more question. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not looking at this side so much, but okay, yeah. <laughs> It's on, it's on the blenders, actually. So it's on the oil companies. And actually, these um, subsidies used to go to the oil companies, which is part of why they were um, removed, is because they would be going to Exxon and Chevron and, you know, these oil companies making so much money and in a high. Um, energy, crude oil price environment already, um, but 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 they're also responsible for meeting the mandates, and so um, there. This is where the RIN identification numbers. There is actually an accounting system for tracking um, um, tracking blending. You know. Um, how much is used, how much of the renewable fuels is going into this, and so forth, and so. Um, so th at the bottom, at, at the bottom line, it's the blenders. But the blenders are working very closely with the ethanol processors. The farmers are just kind of benefiting from this because there's this very high demand, and prices are extremely high for them. The more they produce, the more that just goes into this right now. Up until that 15 billion gallon mandate, you know, we might hit a what's called a blending wall at some point, and that is why the policy to implement E15 came in because um, there was a lot of worry we'd hit this blending wall. We've already supplied all that we can supply, so let's increase what would be demanded out there. And so farmers are just basically benefiting. And it is really, um, really, really interesting if you're interested in uh, politics at all, because when you're looking at this current election with much of the Midwest saying, let's get government out of our hair and we want uh, uh, no government intervention. They're very interested in still having a very strong farm bill that supports their agricultural interests. And if 
uh, if the market can't handle it, they want insurance to know that the government will handle it for them. So it's a kind of a, a hip, hypocritical stance, but it's a historical stance too, and it's true in all countries. So thank you. Thank you.